Go ahead, Miguel. Okay, so this is uh, chapter nine, Help to Others. On the path, the most important condition of this discipleship is readiness to work for the spiritual cause of bringing humanity closer and closer to the realization of God. Enough has been done to make people food-minded. Now they must be made God-minded. The downtrodden and the poor must understand that from the spiritual point of view, their misfortunes and miseries can be made into weapons, weapons in the struggle for the truth. They should be helped to see that these miseries can be counted as gifts from God. And if bravely and cheerfully faced, can become the gateway to eternal happiness. Because of its paramount importance in promoting the true well-being of humanity, spiritual work has a natural claim on all who love humanity. It is very necessary to be quite clear about its nature. The whole world is firmly established in the false idea of separateness and is therefore subject to all the complexities of duality. Spiritual workers have to help redeem the world from the Troyes and imagine duality by bringing home to it the truth of the unity of life. To review briefly the problem of the redemption of mankind as it has been set forth in the preceding parts of this book, the root cause of the illusion of manyness lies in the soul's identification identification with his bodies or with the ego mind. But the gross and the subtle bodies, as well as the ego mind of the mental body, are only media for experiencing the world of duality. They are not the media for knowing the true nature of the soul, which is above them all. By identification with the bodies or the ego mind, the soul gets trapped in the delusion of manyness. Actually, the soul in all bodies and ego minds is just one undivided existence. But as it becomes confused with these bodies and ego minds, which are only vehicles, it considers its, itself to be limited and looks upon itself as being only one among the many of creation. As a consequence, most souls are unconscious of their true nature as God, who is the oneness and the reality of all souls. Thus, God-realization is present in them only in latent form, inasmuch as they have not yet experienced that oneness consciously. On the other hand, those very few who have cast off the veil of duality experience, the duality experience the soul itself without confusing it, with any medium or vehicle. And in this experience, the soul consciously knows itself to be identical with God. In the realization of the truth of this oneness, life finds freedom from all limitation and suffering. For it is the self-affirmation of the infinite as infinity. In this state of spiritual perfection, 
the ego life has been finally and completely surrendered in the experiencing of divine truth. God is known and affirmed as the only reality. To realize God is to dwell in eternity. It is a timeless experience. But spiritual work concerns itself with souls who are caught in the complexity of a creation which is need by time. Therefore, the spiritual workers cannot afford to ignore the element of time and the importance of its flow in creation. To ignore it will be to ignore the spiritual work itself. The task for the spiritual workers is to help in the universal dispensation of truth to a suffering humanity. They had bought to prepare humanity to receive this truth and become established in it themselves. It is extremely important to remember that in helping others leave behind the illusion of duality and attaining spiritual freedom, it is necessary to live and act constantly in the principle of unity. The spiritual worker will be working for others who are inclined to create divisions where they do not exist and who will allow him to respite, not, will allow him no respite. and no respite to recap himself. The minds of people have to be purged completely of all forms of selfishness and narrowness if they are to inherit life in eternity. It is by no means an easy task to persuade people to give up these traits. It is not by accident that people are divided into the rich and the poor the pampered and the neglected, the rulers and the rule, the leaders and the masses, the oppressors and the oppressed, the high and the low, the winners of laurels and the recipients of ignominy. ignominy. These differences are created and sustained by the spiritually ignorant, who are so attached to difference that they are not even conscious of its perversity. They are accustomed to look upon life as divided into separate watertight compartments and are unwilling to give up this separative attitude. When the worker launches upon his spiritual work, he enters a field of divisions to which people cling desperately, which they accentuate and fortify, and which they strive consciously or unconsciously to perpetuate. Mere condemnation of these divisions will not enable the worker to destroy them. Divisions are nourished by separative thinking and they yield only to the touch of love and understanding. People must be won to the life of truth. They cannot be coerced into spirituality. It is not enough for the worker to have unimpaired friendliness and untarnished good, goodwill in his own heart. If he is to succeed in his work, he must give people the conviction that he is helping them to redeem themselves from bondage and suffering and to realize their rightful heritage of the highest. 
There is no other way to help them attain spiritual freedom and enlightenment. To render spiritual help, one should understand clearly the following four points. One, apparent descent to a lower level. It may often be necessary to descend apparently to the level of those who one is trying to help. Though one's purpose is to raise people to a higher level of consciousness, they may fail to profit by what is said unless talk is in terms they understand. What is conveyed to thought feeling should not go over their heads. They are bound to miss it unless it is adapt to their capacity and experience. However, while doing this, it is equally important not to lose one's own level of understanding. Approach and technique will be changed gradually as those being aid arrive at deeper and deeper understanding. And one's own apparent descent to the lower level will be only temporary. Two, a spiritual understanding ensures well-rounded progress. Life must not be divided into departments, which are then deal with separately and successively. Departmental thinking is often an obstacle to integral vision. If one divides life into politics, education, morality, material advancement, science, art, religion, mysticism, and culture, and then thinks exclusively of only one of these aspects, <clears throat> the answers that are brought to life can be neither satisfactory nor final. If one succeeds, however, in awakening a spiritual inspiration and understanding, then progress in all these departments of life is bound to follow automatically. Spiritual workers will have to aim at providing a complete and real solution to all the personal and social problems of life. Three, Spiritual progress consists in the spontaneous growth of understanding from within. Spiritual workers also have to remember that the spiritual wisdom which they wish to convey to others is already present in latent form and that it is only necessary to assist in unveiling that spiritual wisdom in them. Spiritual progress is not a process of accumulation from without. It is an unfoldment from within. A master is necessary for anyone to arrive at self-knowledge, but the true significance of the help given by the master rests in his ability to enable another to come into the full possession of his own latent possibilities. Four, some questions are more important than answers. Spiritual workers must not lose sight of the real work which should be accomplished. When it is clearly understood that spiritual wisdom is latent in all, the worker will no longer be anxious to provide others with ready-made answers. In many cases, he will be content to set up a new problem 
or to clarify the nature of a problem already faced. He may have done his duty if he asks someone a question in a practical situation which that person will not have asked himself. In some cases, the worker will have done his duty if he succeeds in putting another person in a searching attitude so that he begins to understand and attacks his problems along some more fruitful line. The questions the worker may help to formulate should be neither theoretical nor unnecessarily complicated. If they are simple, direct and fundamental, these questions will answer themselves and people will find their own solutions. Nevertheless, indispensable service will have been rendered for, without tactful intervention, the individual will not have arrived at the solution of his various problems from a spiritual point of view. Uh, if I may read that again, nevertheless, indispensable service will have been rendered for, without tactful intervention, the individual will not have arrived at the solution of his various problems from a spiritual point of view. The spiritual worker necessarily is confronted by many obstacles, but obstacles are meant to be overcome, even if some of them seem unsuperable. He must help do his best to help others, irrespective of results or consequences. Obstacles, their surmounting, success, failure, are all illusions within the infinite domain of unity. And the worker's task is already done when it is done wholeheartedly. Work must be performed without worrying about consequence regardless of success or failure. One may be sure that work done in this spirit and with this understanding yields inevitable results. Through the untiring activities of spiritual workers, humanity will be initiated into the new life of abiding peace and dynamic harmony, unconquerable faith and unfading bliss, immortal sweetness, and incorruptible purity, creative love, and infinite understanding. Thanks, Miguel. Gloria, please. Okay. Chapter three, Baba discusses about her hood. In the long run, the man himself must say what he is. If he's Persian, he says so. If he's Catholic, he says so. If he's allergic to onions, he says so. At least he says so when it's important than the that the characteristic shall be known. If it is important that that characteristic be unknown, then he will deliberately suppress the fact. 
Christ was not backward in pointing out his divine function. Mohammed and Buddha, on the other hand, are reported to have insisted that they were ordinary mortals. I am not qualified to argue between the two precedents from which we have to choose. I would prefer to let Baba have its own way and not condemn or condone him on the score that this great one did or that great one didn't. The troublesome thing is that there, that there is always a rather liberal crop of persons who proclaim with no embarrassment that they are divinely appointed to the office of Messiah. Who is right? Or are they all perhaps fakes? Some clue to the question can be gotten sometimes by seeing a meeting between two individuals who both feel their status to be the highest. I accidentally participate in such an occasion in New York. A splendid looking man in his prime asked to see Meher Baba privately in his quarters. As he stood in the hall, his message was taken to Baba by one of the Mandali. The Mandali came back to the door and said that Baba would be happy to see him. Whereupon the man became perturbed and insisted that Baba himself should come to the door and invite him in. Mm -hmm. This, he stated, was no more than just in greeting someone who was one with God. Hitting the fuss at the door, Baba stepped into the line of sight to the doorway and smilingly beckoned the man to enter. This he then did. The temptation to assert one's divine role is almost infinite. Further, there is much evidence to indicate that it is easy for even a highly developed spiritual teacher to conclude that he has the bare right of Christhood. Even if the great teacher himself should not have these illusions, his followers often elect him to that position after his death. The jungle is too rank for one to make a way easily through it. There appears to be only three legitimate Legitimate, legitimate means of concluding the matter of Christhood. The first is the way of one's own heart, through trust in the master himself. Even if one should be wrong in one's estimate, the strength of that faith in the teacher will accomplish things that will dwarf any error in one's judgment. The second way is that of direct experience. That per se means perfection, or at least enlightenment for oneself. And few of us may hope in this lifetime for such absolute knowledge by being. The third is to assess the impact of such a man on the curse of civilization. This cannot be used directly at present because we still live in the man's own time. At best, we can try to measure his effect on people who have been close to him. This has been essayed in previous chapters. The best source material for further study is the man's statements about himself. These are very enlightening, for there is a splendid sense of balance in them which carries conviction in itself. This is what Meher Baba has to say on the subject of his own di divine function. Age after age, when well, when the week of rightness burns low, the avatar comes yet once again to rekindle the torch of love and truth. Age after age, through the noise and disruptions of war, fear, and chaos, the avatar's call rings out, come all unto me. Although the veil of illusion may cause this call of the ancient one to seem as a boy, to seem as a voice in the wilderness, still its echo and recoils pervade through time and space, rousing at first a few, and then millions from their deep slumber of ignorance. In the midst of illusion, as the voice behind all voices, it awakens humanity to bear witness to the manifestation of God amidst mankind. The time has come 
I repeat the call and bid all come unto me. This time honored call of mine thrills the hearts of those who have patiently endured all in their love of God for God, loving God only for God. Sorry, mm -hmm. again, I will read it again. This time honored call of mine thrills the hearts of those who have patiently endured all in their love of, for God, loving God only for love of God. There are others who fear and shudder at his reverberations and go flee or resist. And there are yet others who are baffled, failing to understand why the all sufficient highest of the high need give this call to humanity. Regardless of the doubts or conviction people may have, I continue to come as the avatar because of the infinite love I bear for one and all. Though judged time and again by humanity in its ignorance, I come to help man distinguish the real from the false. The divine call is little heeded at first because it's invariable muffle in the clock of the infinite true humility of the ancient one. Yet in its infinite strength, it grows in volume until it reverberates and continues to reverberate in countless hearts as the voice of reality. Strength gives rise to humility, while modesty indicates weakness. Only he who is truly great can be really humble. When a man admits his true greatness in the firm knowledge of his greatness, that is in itself an expression of humility. He accepts his greatness as completely natural and merely expresses what he is, just as a man would not hesitate to admit that he is a man. If a truly great man who knows himself to be truly great were to deny his greatness, this good be belittle that he indubitable is, for modesty is the basis of guise, while true greatness is free from camouflage. On the other hand, when a man expresses a greatness he knows he does not possess, he's the greatest of hypocrites. The man is honest, who, knowing that he is not great, firmly and frankly states that he is not great. There are more than a few who are not great, yet assume an air of humility, of humility despite their belief in their own considerable worth. Through both words and actions, they repeatedly express their humblessness, professing to be the servants of humanity. True humility is not acquired by donning a garb of humility. True humility emanates spontaneously and continually from the strength of the truly great. Voicing one's humblessness does not make one humble. Regardless of how often a parrot may say, I am a man, it does not make him a man. The absence of greatness is better than the establishment of false greatness by assumed humility. These efforts at humility not only do not express strength, but on the contrary, they are expressions of modesty born of a weakness which springs from a lack of knowledge of reality. Th thanks, Gloria. Mahu, please. Quote, beware of modesty under the cloak of humanity, humility it invariably leads one into the clutches of self-deception. Modesty breeds egotism, and man eventually succumbs to pride through assumed humility. The greatest greatness and the greatest humility go hand in hand naturally and without effort. When the greatest of all says, I am the greatest, 
It is only a spontaneous expression of an infallible truth. The strength of his greatness does not lie in the rising of the dead, but in his great humiliation when he allows himself to be ridiculed, per persecuted, and crucified by those who are weak in flesh and spirit. Throughout the ages, humanity has failed to gauge the true depths of humility underlaying the greatness of the avatar. They judge his divinity by their own limited standards acquired from the religions. Even real saints and sages who have some knowledge of truth have failed to understand the avatar's greatness when faced with his real humility. History repeats itself through the ages as men and women in their ignorance, limitation, and pride sit in judgment on the God incarnated man who declares his godhood, condemning him for uttering the truths they cannot understand. But he is indifferent to abuse and persecution. For in his true con compassion, he understands. In his continual experiencing of reality, he knows. And in his infinite mercy, he forgives. God is all, God knows all, and God does all. When the avatar proclaims that he is the ancient one, it is God who proclaims his manifestation on earth. When man speaks for or against the avatar, it is God who speaks through him. It is God alone who declares himself through the avatar and through mankind. I tell you all with my divine authority that you and I are not we, but one. You unconsciously feel my avatarhood within you. I consciously feel in you what each of you feels. Thus, every one of us is the avatar in the sense that everyone and everything is everyone and everything all at the same time and for all time. There is nothing but God. He is the only reality. And we are all one in the indivisible oneness of this absolute reality. When one man who has realized God says, I am God, you are God, and we are all one. And when he also awakens this feeling of oneness in his illusion bound selves or mankind, then questions of low, lowly and great, poor and rich, humble and modest, good and bad, simply vanish. It is man's false awareness, it is man's false awareness of duality that misleads him into making illusory distinctions and feeling the results into separate categories, filing the results into separate categories, sorry. I repeat and emphasize that in my eternal experiencing of reality, no difference exists between the rich and the poor, 
If, however, such question of difference between affluence and poverty were ever to exist for me, I would consider the one really poor who possessed worldly riches, but not the wealth of love for God. I would know that he was truly rich who owned nothing but possessed the priceless treasure of God, treasure of love for God. His is the poverty that kings may envy and that makes even the king of kings his slave. In the eyes of God, the only difference between the rich and the poor is the intensity and sincerity of their longing for God. Only love for God can annihilate the falsity of the limited ego, which is the basis of life ephemeral. Only love for God can bring one to the realization of the reality of one's unlimited ego which is the basis of eternal existence. The divine ego expresses itself continually, but man shrouded in the veil of ignorance, misconstrues this indivisible ego, experiencing and expressing it as the limited, separate ego. Listen when I say with divine authority that the oneness of reality is so totally unlimited and all pervading that not only are we all one, but even the collective term called we has no place in the infinite indivisible oneness. Quote again, Awaken from your ignorance and try at least to understand that in this completely indivisible oneness, not only is the avatar God, but also the ant and the sparrow and one and all of you are nothing but God. The only apparent difference is in their states of consciousness. The avatar knows that the sparrow is not a sparrow, while the sparrow does not realize this. Being ignorant of its ignorance, it identifies itself as a sparrow. Do not live in ignorance. Do not waste your precious time differentiating and judging your fellow man, but learn to long for the love of God. Even in the midst of your worldly activities, live only to find and realize your true identity with your beloved God. Be pure and simple and love all because all are one. Live a sincere life, be natural and be honest with yourself. Honesty will guard you against false modesty and will give you the strength of true humility. Spare no pains to help others. Seek no reward other than the gift of divine love. Yearn for this gift sincerely and intensely. And I promise in the name of my divine honesty that I will give you much more than you yearn for. Here we have Baba's statement on what must be said about position and abilities. He drives a hard point in differentiation, differentiating between false modesty, the strength and frankness of true humility, 
and the blatancy of rank egotism. He then leaves out one sentence, quote, this is why I must tell you what I am, the highest of the high. He does not insist that one believe him, but he states his avatarhood as a literal fact, and it is then one's, one's own responsibility to decide whether to believe him or not. If one rejects Baba's statement that he is the avatar of the age, then there is a chance that one will be right and therefore able to nod someday in agreement with millions of other people who were not taken in by the claims of another deluded Messiah. If one accepts Baba and his statement that he is the avatar of the age, then there is a chance of having been among the relatively few who believed him and accepted him and who as a consequence had the incomparable privilege of his grace. One cannot help but think in retrospect of the millions of who knew of Muhammad and Jesus and Buddha, but who failed to listen to them because the chance seemed so light that the avatar or even a great spiritual teacher was really at hand. Meher Babo has other comments on this point. In 1953, he gave the following message to his close followers in Dehradun, India. Quote, I want you to make me your constant companion. Think of me more than you think of your own self. The more you think of me, the more you will realize my love for you. Your duty is to keep me constantly with you throughout your thoughts, speech, and action. They do their duty who surrender to me through their faith and love guided by their implicit belief in my divinity. They too do their duty who speak ill of me and condemn me through their writings prompted by their genuine conviction that Baba is a fraud. But those who constantly doubt because they do not know their own minds are the hypocrites. Again, but those who constantly doubt because they do not know their own minds are the hypocrites. Through false emotions, they tend at times to believe in me and at other times to gossip slanderously against me. No amount of a slander can affect or change me, nor any amount of admiration or praise enhance my divinity. Baba is what he is. I was Baba, I am Baba, and I shall forever remain Baba. In the same general period, he had more to say at Dehradun on the subject of the coming of the avatar, the reception he receives, and his relation to those who come to him for guidance. Age after age, the infinite God wills through his infinite mercy to come among mankind 
by descending to the human level in a human form. His physical presence among mankind is not understood and he is looked upon as an ordinary man of the world. When he asserts his divinity by proclaiming himself the avatar of the age, he is worshipped worship by some who accept him as God and glorified by a few who know him as God on earth. It happens invariably, though, that the rest of humanity condemns him while he is physically among them. Thus God as man proclaims himself as the avatar and allows himself to be persecuted and tortured, humiliated, and condemned by humanity for, those for, whose, for whose sake his infinite love has made him stoop so low. Through his very humiliation, he ensures that humanity in its very act of condemning God's manifestation as the avatar shall assert, however indirectly, the existence of God in his infinite eternal state. The avatar is always one and the same and the same because God is always one and the same. This eternally one and the same avatar repeats his manifestation from time to time in different cycles. He adopts different human forms and different names, coming to different places to reveal truth in, the, in different clothing and different languages. This he does to raise humanity from the pit of ignorance and help free it from the bondage of delusion. Among the best known and honored manifestations of God as the avatar, the earliest is Zoroaster. He came before Ram, Krishna, Buddha, Jesus, and Muhammad. Thousands of years ago, he gave the world the essence of truth in the name, in the form of three fundamental precepts, good, th good thoughts, good words, and good deeds. These precepts are constantly unfolded for humanity in one manner and another by the avatar of the age who leads humanity, humanity imperceptibly towards the truth. To put these precepts of good thoughts, good words, and good deeds into practice is not as easy as, as it would seem, but yet not impossible. To live up to them, though, is as infinitely difficult as to practice a living death in the midst of life. Thank you, Mahu. Marion, please, could you unmute? In the world, there are countless sadhus, mahatmas, mahapurushas, saints, yogis, and walis. The few genuine ones of these are in a category of their own, neither on a level with the ordinary human being, nor on a level with that state, which is the highest of the high. I am neither a Mahatma nor a Mahapurush, neither sadhu nor saint, 
neither yogi nor wali. Those who come to me to gain wealth or retain their possessions to seek relief from suffering or help to fulfill their mundane desires. To these I declare once again that I am not sadhu, saint, ahatma, mahapurush, or yogi. To seek such things through me is to court utter disappointment. However, such disappointment is only apparent for eventually it is invariably instrumental in bringing about the complete transformation of one's worldly desires. Sadhus, saints, yogis, walis, and such others who are on the via media can and do perform miracles. They satisfy the transient material needs of individuals who approach them for help. But if I am not a sadhu, saint, yogi, mahapurush, nor wali, then what am I? The natural conclusion would be that either I am just an ordinary human being or I am the highest of the high. Definitely, I can never be included among those having the intermediary status of real sadhus, saints, yogis, and such like. If I am just an ordinary man, my capabilities and powers are limited. I am no different from an ordinary human being. In such case, people should not expect any supernatural help from me in the form of miracles or spiritual guidance. Also, to approach me to fulfill their desires would be absolutely futile. On the other hand, if I am beyond the level of an ordinary human being and much beyond the level of saints and yogis, then I must be the highest of the high. In such case, to judge me with the human intellect and to approach me with worldly desires would be the height of ignorance and folly. If I am the highest of the high, my will is law. My wishes govern the law and my love sustains the universe. Then your apparent calamities and transient sufferings are only the outcome of my love for the ultimate good. Therefore, to approach me for deliverance from predicaments and to expect me to satisfy worldly desires would be asking me to do the impossible, to undo what I have already ordained. If you accept Baba in all faith as the highest of the high, it behooves you to lay down your life at his feet rather than crave fulfillment of your desires. Not this one life, but your millions of lives would only be a small sacrifice to lay at the feet of one such as Baba who is the highest of the high. For Baba's unbounded love is the only sure and unfailing guide which can lead you safely through the innumerable blind alleys of your transient life. They cannot obligate me who surrender their all, body, mind, <clears throat> possessions <clears throat> with a motive, nor can I be snared by those who surrender because they understand that to gain the everlasting treasure of bliss, 
they must relinquish passing possessions. A desire for greater gain still clings to their surrenderance, and therefore the surrender cannot be complete. You must all know that if I am the highest of the high, you must all know that if I am the highest of the high, my role demands that I strip you of all your possessions and wants, consume all your desires and make you desireless. This I must do rather than satisfy your desires. Sadhus, saints, yogis, and walis can give you what you want, but I take away your wants, free you from attachments, and liberate you from the bondage of ignorance. I am the one to take, not give, what you want. Intellectuals can never understand me through intellect alone. If I am the highest of the high, it is impossible for intellect to gauge me, nor can my ways be fathomed by the limited human mind. I am not to be attained by those who, through love of me, stand reverentially by in rapt admiration. I am also not for those who ridicule me and point at me with contempt. Nor am I here to have tens of millions flock around me. I am for the select few who, scattered among the crowd, silently surrender to me their all, body, mind, and possessions. Still more, I am here for those who, having surrendered all, never give another thought to their surrender. All those are mine who are prepared to renounce even the very thought of their renunciation and who, keeping constant vigil in the midst of intense activity, await their turn to lay down their lives for the cause of truth at a glance from me. Those who have indomitable courage to face cheerfully the worst calamities, who have unshakable faith in me and are eager to fulfill my slightest wish at the cost of happiness and comfort, these indeed truly love me. From my point of view, the atheist who honorably accepts his worldly responsibilities and discharges them conscientiously is far more blessed than the man who thinks he is a devout believer in God and yet shirks the responsibilities apportioned to him by divine law. Running instead after sadhus, saints, and yogis to seek relief from the suffering which ultimately would have effected his liberation. To have also one eye glued on the delightful pleasures of the flesh and to expect to see a spark of eternal bliss with the other is not only impossible, but the height of hypocrisy. I cannot expect you to understand what I want you to know all at once. It is my charge to awaken you from time to time through the ages, sowing the seed in your limited minds, which in due course and with proper attention on your part must germinate, flourish, and bear that fruit of true knowledge, which is your birthright. On the other hand, if, led by your ignorance, 
you persist in going your own way. None can stop the course of progress you have chosen. For that too is progress, which leads you after innumerable incarnations to realize what I want you to know now. Awake now and save yourself from further entanglement in the maze of delusion and self-created suffering, which is dependent upon your ignorance of the true goal. Listen and strive for freedom by placing ignorance in its proper position. Be honest with yourself and God. It is possible to fool one's neighbors and even the whole world, but it is impossible to escape the knowledge of the omniscient. Such is divine law. Seek me not to extricate yourself from predicaments, but find me in order to surrender yourself wholeheartedly to my will. Do not cling to me for worldly happiness and short-lived comforts, but adhere to me through thick and thin, sacrificing your own happiness and comforts at my feet. Let my happiness be your cheer and my comforts your rest. Do not ask me to bless you with a good job. Wish only to serve me more diligently and honestly without expectation of reward. Never beg me to save your life or the lives of your dear ones. Only beg me to accept you and permit you to lay down your life for me. Never expect me to cure you of your bodily afflictions. Beseech me rather to cure you of your ignorance. Never stretch out your hands to receive anything from me. Hold them high in praise of me, whom you have approached as the highest of the high. If I am the highest of the high, then nothing is impossible for me. However, I have often said that I do not perform miracles to satisfy individual needs, for this would only result in entangling the individual further into the net of ephemeral existence. On the other hand, for the spiritual upliftment and benefit of all humanity and all creatures. At certain periods, I do manifest the infinite power I possess in the form of miracles. However, miraculous experiences have often occurred to individuals who love and have faith in me. And these have been attributed to my nazar or grace. But I want everyone to know that it is not fit for those who love me to attribute such miraculous experiences to my state of the highest of the high. If I am the highest of the high, then I am above this illusory play of Maya. Therefore, the miraculous experiences described by those who love me or by those who love me unknowingly through other channels are only the product of their own firm faith in me. That unshakable faith often supersedes the course of play of Maya and thus produces what they describe as miracles. Such experiences derived through firm faith do not entangle those individuals into further binding in illusion, but eventually do good. If I am the highest of the high, 
than a wish by my universal will can give God realization to one and all in an instant, freeing every creature in creation from the shackles of ignorance. But blessed is knowledge that is gained through the experience of ignorance in accordance with the divine law. Such knowledge is attainable in the midst of ignorance through the guidance of perfect masters and by surrenderance to the highest of the high. Thanks, Marian. Rolf, could you unmute and continue? Rolf, are you at your machine? No? Okay, well, I'll read until you get here. An entire book could be written in commentary on these two important documents. However, I intend to belabor only one point. So this is Don Stevens talking again. If one forgets for the moment that these statements are being made by a living man, and if one neglects temporarily the crisis in judgment which they pose, then one cannot but be struck by the fundamental nature of what is said. Here without question is a man who knows to the nth degree what he is talking about and who possesses an insight into an absolute ethics, which would tax the greatest hearts and minds. But the residual question which causes the reader to tend to neglect the import of what is being said is the almost unbelievable statement by Baba that he is the, quote, highest of the high, unquote. Baba says dispassionately that it is the lot of the avatar to be accepted by only a handful in his lifetime. There would seem no need then for those who accept Baba to try to convince the rest of humanity that it is overlooking the best bet of many lifetimes. However, it is important to look briefly into the meaning of rejection in general terms. Sooner or later, each human being must be willing to annihilate for a time his own sense of self-determination in a sense of, of absolute trust of another. And that is starred. Trust in or identification with another human being is not peculiar to the follower of the guru. It has its modern counterpart in the relation of patient to psychoanalyst, of friend to trusted advisor of one who loves to the beloved. Such a relation apparently involves a very fundamental principle of nature in which the complexities of self can be attacked at their root through the loss or lessening of self in the being of another. Only in this manner can there be the opportunity to comb out the snarls of countless accumulated actions in one's nature. Even when a person is unhappiest, he still has a, a persistent sense of unconscious hope that his own deliberated actions will one day lead him to success and happiness. Usually it is only the person who has almost entirely ceased to hope, who is willing to take the conscious step 
of annihilating his own ego in the person of another. For in annihilating his ego, he denies the very core of the quote unquote right of free will, of self-determination. And in that destruction, there is bound to go his most stubborn ego-centered hope for the future. Once it is gone, he is really at sea. There is no landmark, no point of reliance or help, only that cause or person to whom he has perhaps by now given his allegiance. This is a frightening position and it is no wonder that most people would prefer to trust their own fallible but visible sense of self-determination rather than surrender it to another's possible whims. There are few people who have, who have reached either such desperation in the successive traps of life or enlightenment in the inner processes of the heart, to be willing to trust their fate implicitly to another being. This is the challenge which frightens people, not only with Baba, but to a degree with all religious personages, faiths, and movements. Baba poses the issue indelibly, however, clearly and repeatedly. For this reason, there's often little opportunity to appreciate the scope and style of his statements. The human challenge they contain is too profound. Then one day, the great teacher passes on the words can be read with academic interest in their loftiness of precept and the beauty of their phrasing. The rugged, stripped bare challenge of a personal and immediate surrender is no longer present. Then the great man begins to be appreciated. Or is he appreciated really? Actually, I do not think he is. The real importance of such a person is in what is done in the direct personal relationship. The important people are the ones who went through whatever hell there was in fighting the thing through in the intensity of the living challenge. What comes after may have its glory, its beauty, its mass acceptance, but these are a pale shadow to the real man and the vitality of the living relation. <clears throat> this is the challenge for man, and there are always individuals on earth who will present it to him. At some time, he must meet it and finally realize that the one who poses it does not do it for himself, but for love of the people who must know themselves. This process of finding oneself through losing the self in a perfect being is the essential core of Baba's technique in dealing with people. <clears throat> All of the puzzling and sometimes distressing admonishment, ad admonishments he makes are aimed at this goal. It isn't that one's own self is necessarily a bad thing. It just happens to have the unfortunate property of seeming completely separate. 
once having lost oneself in the master's being, not through desire, for that again simply emphasizes the separateness, but through the welding action of a unifying love, then much or even all of the illusion of separateness is lost. Baba's constant exhortation to give up all and come to him is first of all a dramatic but honest effort to get the individual to withdraw his attention from a multitude of distractions. This is the first essential step. The next is to lose one's own self completely in Baba. This is the part which is resisted so mightily. Such a step has absolutely nothing to do with enhancing the prestige of Baba. If he were a sublime egotist, it could. In cold print, the repeated insistence on this point sounds as if Baba might be such a divine egotist. In the presence of Baba, one understands at once that this is completely aside from the true issue. The question of losing oneself in Baba may still be acute even after meeting Baba, but the possibility of Baba's involvement for Baba's own personal reasons falls out of the picture. The issue now is the real extent of one's trust and love versus the persistent habit of one's sense of separateness. In this arena, the true battle is waged. It is an astonishingly passive battle on Baba's part. He is simply himself and shows constantly an unbelievable forgiveness and thoughtfulness. How can one's ego go on constantly rebelling against him? Whenever one's rebellion flares, it is met only by understanding and compassion. Finally, rebellion turns back upon itself and there is rebellion against rebellion itself. The wall of separate egotism is breached at this point in identification with another human being. This is the way known to lovers, to the mystics of the world religions, and to many who deal honestly and patiently with the deepest needs of modern man. The only question is how well the person to whom one identifies knows his own self. The positive effects resulting from the identification will depend largely on the answer. Even in the event that there is no greater depth of perception of self in the other, the fact of winning some sense of oneness is nevertheless a positive gain in the direction of reality. On the other hand, if there is greater knowledge of the self in the other being, then the possibilities of the situation are rich. M Mona, would you like to read unmute first then? To realize those possibilities, the link between the two must be completely unobstructed, for the possibilities can be completely exhausted only if there is a complete sense of oneness, born of honesty, sincerity, and true depth of feeling. This means that there can be no sense of separateness of personal interest in contrast to that of the other person. This would act only as a checkpoint for the free flow 
of self to self. The age old question of desire owes its continuing importance to its effect on this linking bridge of oneness. Desire has a simple statement to make. I desire you. It is only necessary to reflect on one's own desires to understand that they empathize the separation of the one who desires and the un obtainable nature of the object desired. Therefore, desire is a problem, not primarily because of the physical element, which is so deeply involved, but because of the emotional element of separateness, which it feeds. Love also has a very simple statement to make. I love you. One has only to reflect for a few moments to find that here the inner sense is quite different, being one of closeness, of security in a word, of oneness. This is why love has always instinctively been respected, praised and sought. It feeds man and brings him far in the direction of knowing his own self through knowing another. If lust has been ordained to have this effect, lust would have been rightfully acclaimed by the poets and mystics. Social customs and taboos are based in the long run on almost unerring sense of what generally aids or hinders man in his constant endeavor to find his real self. Morality is not an act of piety, but of effect to lay the climate in which the seed of self-knowledge may sprout. When one is moral, the approval of society then one is immoral and the effort is worse than worthless when one is moral because of deep internal needs then the sun really shines but one should never assume that one man's morality is another's Social morality bears the same relationship to the love of another as religion does to guiding of man to find his soul. It is a helpful first step, but there must be room for rapid change and progress. When the real query comes in sight, then morality becomes really alive, is self-generating, and often has little resemblance to the average conventionalized version. All morality, whether social or personal, is aimed at the eventual development of the most honest and therefore most complete love of another person. The love of another person is one of the greatest goods because it strips bare the self and fuses it into the substance of another. As this happens, it is realized dimly or intensely that no fusion was necessary. The oneness was there all the time. As the sense of oneness grows, there is the possibility of plumbing to the depths of oneself. Through the sense of realization of self in another. At this point enters the mystic, the great religious teacher, the saint, the guru, the messiah. It is possible to realize one's own self, one's own true nature, 
completely and irrevocably through establishing a perfect sense of oneness with one who has perfectly realized himself. Such a person is called God realized. For the theorem also states that the one who has perfectly realized himself has discovered that he and the Father are one. Therefore, the immense importance of the Christ for in him resides the greatest opportunity to achieve perfect oneness with the divine being. If one studies Mayor Baba's statements in the context of this ultimate challenge to achieve the ultimate goal, then they will be seen to lead with unwearying straightness to this point. One may not be able to de determine for oneself whether Baba is the perfect instrument for the achieving of this goal. But if he is not, then he has laid out the necessary course with astonishing clarity. One final time. Let us let Meher Baba speak for himself on this point. I am the one so many seek and so few find. No amount of intellect can fathom me. No amount of austerity can attain me. Only when one loves me and lo loses oneself in me am I found. And again, all these statements and messages can lead us nowhere on the spiritual path. Reasoning and mental conviction also leads us nowhere. Even actual experience falls short of the highest state. The more you try to understand God, the less you understand Him. How can He, who is beyond all explaining, be described? His being infinitely easy to know has rendered Him infinitely difficult. The secret is that you have become what you already are. You can know me as one of you and one in you only when the veil of separateness are lifted. And this can be done if you love me honestly and wholeheartedly. Lose yourself in Baba and you will find that you eternally were Baba. There can be no compromise in love. It has either to be full or not at all. I say with divine authority that I am the ancient one and the slave of those who really love 